Chad Booth, welcome to the county seat. Got a question for you. You go down to the produce stand, you buy some peaches, you buy some lettuce, you buy some corn, you take it home. What makes you think it's safe? Well, you're counting on the fact that there are regulations to make sure that produce grower got it to the field correctly. That's what our show's about today, Food Safety Modernization Act. We're gonna start by looking at the history of food regulation to get our discussion going. Utahns, just like most Americans, love their food. It is estimated that the average person eats around four pounds of food in a day. And over the course of the year, the average American eats almost a ton of food. Yep, you heard me right, a ton. On a daily basis, we are consuming all kinds of foods, from breads and meats to fruits and vegetables. <laughs> but how much thought do you actually put into how safe that food is? The honest answer for most of us would be none. And that's because we trust that food retailers and restaurants are checking our food for safety. And that is all thanks to food safety laws that have been in place for over a hundred years. Food safety laws in the United States got their start in 1906, after a novel published that year inadvertently brought attention to food safety and sanitation in the Chicago meatpacking industry. After reading the novel, President Theodore Roosevelt called on Congress to pass the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Federal Meat Inspection Act, the first food safety laws our nation had ever seen. The two laws helped to address food safety by regulating food additives for the first time and were the first steps for truth in labeling. More small acts would be created over the next few decades to regulate food coloration additives, chemical preservatives, and food marketing. And in 1969, sanitation programs for shellfish and milk were added. The next big change in food safety wouldn't happen for several decades. So the Food Safety Modernization Act is the most sweeping reform of our food safety regulations in more than 70 years. Uh, it was signed into law back in January of 2011. What made this new law notable was the shift from laws that were reactive to proactive. Instead of waiting for things to happen, the Food and Drug Administration is now taking direct action to make food consumption safer for Americans everywhere. The purpose or the reason for the Food Safety Modernization Act um, was as a result of several factors, including globalization, um, more people consuming produce than ever before, um, and better science. That newfound safety won't be easy or cheap to come by. And in our panel discussion, we'll discuss how the latest steps in implementing the new law will affect both consumers and food producers in Utah counties. For the county seat, I'm Malia Stringham. And that brings us to our conversation of the day, the Food Safety Modernization Act. How is it going to implement in Utah? We will pick that conversation up with our panel of experts when we come back on the county seat. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking today on uh, food safety in Utah, and uh, we've kind of gone through a little bit of background on uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act and some of the acts that have gotten us to here. Joining us for our discussion about food safety, Karen Allen, who is a food quality specialist with USU Extension. We have Thane Taggy, a veteran of County Seat, who is the Chief Farming Officer, I like that title, of Taggy's Fruits, LLC, and David Basinger, who is uh, a Program Manager for the Utah Department of Ag and Food. Thank you all for joining us today. So, <clears throat> We have a we have an, a, a law that was passed what five six years ago. It's been in the process of being implemented. It's almost all the way through, and now it's going to start to take effect on modernization of food. And it broadly broadly expands uh, the obligations of of food inspection and the interaction between food makers, processors, and consumers. So I want to start by by talking about how these implementations, particularly in the areas of produce, are changing the game for inspectors. What, what, what kind of obligations are now, uh, you know, what do you, have, what, what do you guys have to do now that you didn't before? Do you want to go ahead and tell us a little I, bit about the I'll, law? Or? Uh, well, some background just on the law. Be aware that there are seven separate parts that affect everything from produce growing through manufacturing, transportation and warehousing, in addition to imports, 
and we are seeing some compliant states that have already started, others that will be coming through the next several years. And this is a huge law that is designed to make recalls more effective, um, have them occur more quickly before an outbreak has a chance to spread. But this does put an increased burden on our inspectors, those people that are involved in regulatory enforcement. And the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food is going to be taking the lead for that in the state of Utah, especially for the produce portion. So let me ask what a compliant state is. Is, you know, is Utah a compliant state and Colorado isn't, or does that mean something different? So what it means is when the FDA passes a final rule and says, okay, this regulation now has to be met, our producers, our growers, our importers don't have to meet it on that day. They may have one, two, three, or even more years, depending on the specific regulation, mm -hmm. to actually get to the point that they're complying with that new rule. So we will see different compliance dates for different parts of FSMA, and also within the produce safety rule, there will be different compliance dates. For example, a date when someone might have to make sure all their workers are trained, versus when they have to start doing testing of the water that they use for irrigation purposes. So is this applied the same all the way across the board? I, I mean, you know, it's just FSMA, I, I like that acronym, uh, it passes, and then all of a sudden um, the, the neighborhood garden around the corner now has to come into compliance? Not necessarily. That depends on the size of the grower. Very small farms that are doing under $25,000 a year in total produce sales will not have to comply. The only thing they'll have to do is keep financial records just to document that they're below that $25,000 a year threshold. For a, farms that are a little larger, doing up to $500,000 a year, they may still be exempt from many parts of the rule. They could qualify for what the FDA has termed a qualified exemption. And that depends on who they're selling to, how much they're selling in total food, not just produce. But then for anyone who is above that $500,000 a year threshold or who is selling to large warehouses or grocery stores, <clears throat> they will have to comply with the full part of that produce safety rule. So saying, everybody's seen the taggy fruit stands sure. around with the nice handmade signs. Are you big enough that yeah. this, this is gonna be a compliance issue? Yeah, for we meet like the above $500,000 a uh, uh, amount and so we're, we're going to be subject to FSMA and we knew that that was coming down the road and we've been preparing ourselves for it because we know it's going to be there and stick around. So are, are there a lot of things that now come that have to come under compliance or under inspection that didn't before? So a lot of the larger growers like uh, Thane here have already been participating in other programs such as USDA GAP or Harmonized GAP or Global GAP and these were voluntary programs that came about in the early 2000s, around 2001s, in an effort for uh, retail operations to make sure that they were receiving uh, good quality, healthy produce. And so, like Thane, Thane participates in that program. So where he has been doing that, it's very similar to what this FISMA law is. And so for someone like Thane, it's really not gonna be a large adjustment for him. For these growers that don't participate in it, it may be something that, that is a real game changer for them. Yeah, and, and I'm thinking more in terms of, of what's gonna be required uh, for you guys. I mean, from the inspection side, or for not necessarily for extension, but ag and food, uh, you know, the Food and Drug Administration, you know, Who's going to be, uh, I mean, this sounds like there's going to have to be a lot more boots on the ground than before. Is that right? So, so luckily in the state of Utah, uh, we've gone forward and we've decided as a state to uh, adopt this rule. And therefore, it will be our inspectors from the Utah Department of Agriculture and Food doing the actual inspections instead of FDA. And so that will require us to do more uh, uh, inspections from a from our standpoint, standpoint on these farmers. Is this an unfunded mandate that I'm seeing right now? So right now we do have a grant from the FDA 
to actually go through and help with education of the farmers um, and also conduct the inspections right now. So what we are hoping to do is to have this one time or have this, this money available to go through and basically go through our farmers and do these uh, inspections and on-farm readiness reviews to get them ready. And then as time goes by, there won't be near as much for us to actually uh, inspect once we go through and do the initial inspections at each operation. So do you feel that, that the farmers are basically willing to be in this compliance? Well, how this, how this works is it's, it's, it, this rule is to make produce safer for people in the U.S. So not only do farmers here in, in the United States have to abide by this, but farm, international farmers, so Mexico and India and other places where we may get food, also have to uh, abide by these rules in order to sell their produce in the States. So uh, I, I guess I have a question because uh, as you describe this to me, it just looks like a huge thing that, that you now are going to have to uh, inspect. Does it apply the same if you're growing, uh, you know, like sugar peas as to whether you're growing alfalfa, whether you're are, are all the all the foods under the same set of, ex, uh, of laws or? So this specific part of FSMA, the produce safety rule, applies to produce. That doesn't cover anything that would be considered animal feed, like alfalfa. It also doesn't cover things like grains, like wheat. Um, this applies to those commodities that we think of typically as produce, our potatoes, corn, berries, fruits, and other vegetables. Now, there are certain types of produce that are exempted under this law by the FDA because the FDA conducted an analysis of food consumption patterns and anything that they determined was rarely consumed raw by the average consumer is exempt. So exempted produce includes things like potatoes, sweet corn, and winter squash, things where they would normally be cooked before they're consumed. Okay. Uh, well, I guess that brings it in just a little bit. We're going to take a quick break here on the county seat. We're going to come back. We're going to pick up the gauntlet and talk about the impact on farmers uh, when we come back on the new FISMA. I like, I like that. FISMA has a nice ring to it. We'll be right back on the county seat. Welcome back to the county seat. We are talking about the uh, food safety uh, situation in the state of Utah with new federal regulations. We kind of covered the regulatory side of it and a little bit of background about that, but now we want to turn our attention to what it means for guys that grow produce. So I guess, Thane, the, the first question I would have is, do you see this as making a, a peck of peaches more expensive for me next year than it was last year? Well, let me tell you. <clears throat> So we've been anticipating this for quite a while, kind of dragged our feet, but we knew we had to pull the trigger this last year. So two years ago, we were doing some planning and uh, there's two groups of farmers, a group uh, that started down south and now up north, about 16 of us <clears throat> and associated to put together a great program that reduced our costs, helped us design programs to get started on this. So we have to go through first of all, and assess our risks as part of the farm. Like we've talked a little bit about behind the scenes here. What's, what's really, what are the issues involved with my farm that would cause some problems? We address all those, then we write programs for them. Then we train our, the employees, everybody that works for us, how to, be, how to handle the fruit, how to be safe, how to, how to keep an earring out of the, a pierced earring out of the, the fruit. It just goes all the way down. <clears throat> to the delivery trucks to uh, getting it to market. And um, let me just tell you, it was a lot of work, okay? It was a lot of stress. And I know that some of these farmers aren't gonna like this because it's not, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, okay? So, but we did it. We had two internal audits, had to make some adjustments. Dave was actually le uh, one of my uh, inspectors. He came out too and had to make some more adjustments, things that we just didn't even know yet. And go, but we see their point and we make those adjustments, corrective actions, and we move on from there. So this isn't very fun for us, but I see the benefits in it. It's great. I, f 
I feel like I'm a better farmer, safer farmer, and feel really good about you know what we're delivering to the public, and, and it's good. So you're kind of intimating that this isn't just an across the board thing, that it, that it is um, almost farm specific. I think so. I so, mean, every so what what makes your peach orchard different than the guy exactly down the road by the da by the dairy farm? What, Get what that dairy farm? I don't have a dairy farm next to me. I don't have I don't have water issues by me. I'm straight out of Pine View. <clears throat> you know, we need to address our surroundings. However, I have raccoons getting into the corn. Okay, so I got to address that. How am I going to handle the raccoons? You know what I mean? Because you you know that can cause problems. Carefully, they bite very carefully. <laughs> so there's all these different issues associated with what we're doing uh -huh. and, and how we're approaching our farm. It's great. You know, it's a great way to approach it smart and, and uh, I think it's valuable. It, how expensive, I mean, okay. I don't want you to have to give up your trade sure. secrets or anything, but this is going to cost you, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's money and time and stress and effort. I spent a lot of time, and I mean a lot of time, doing this, implementing this. I, buy, I, I bought a new pesticide storage shed to secure those pesticides even better than I have in the past. And we imp I'm buying plastic bins for my corn now instead of wood bins just to relieve an issue of contamination with wood, et cetera, getting into the product. There's all these different things going to plastic than more than other byproducts that would, that would hold contamination. All these things we have to address. So you can, yeah, you're looking at, yeah. Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss the, the wood bushel basket. It's hey, wood's not good. <laughs> hey, you know, it's, it's better to pick with clean hands, no gloves than even, you know, because gloves can get contaminated. There's all these things that we're learning on, you know, on things that we can control and things that we can't control with our pickers, et cetera, that we've had to address and, and take care of. And he's an, Dave's an expert on this, and he helped me realize some things that you know we were doing wrong that we needed to correct. Was he a good student? He <coughs> was, very good student. Is it, do you have, a, I mean, do some of the people that you have to go in and help get ready for this new process and inspections, do they resist? Um, I think they do it first until you explain to them and kind of show them that it's a benefit to them. So by them being able to pr produce produce that uh, does not have contamination uh, is, is good sense for them, good business sense. If, if a contaminated produce goes out, is the farmer liable for the people that get sick? We have seen cases in the past, like for example, the cantaloupe outbreak from several years ago, where those farms were bankrupted because of the lawsuits that were brought against them. So there's the possibility for there to be civil penalties. Um, they can you know, be held responsible for medical bills, in addition to the potential for them to actually do prison time. Yes, so it's a huge issue for, that farmers need to take seriously. All right, well, we've covered, the, we've covered the problem with farmers. We've covered the challenges to regulators. Now we're gonna find out what it means to customers and the consumers when we get back here on the county seats. It's been a good conversation. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the county seat. We have been talking about the Food Safety uh, Act and what it means for uh, people here in Utah. We've covered, we've covered the regulatory, we've covered the impact to the farmer. Now, what does it mean to you and I? Um, I will have to uh, admit uh, in full guilt that there is a taggage fruit stand right, right near my house and um, it's very convenient for me on my way to work to pop in there and get stuff. And so I, I frequent one of your, one of your stands. And, and I had nothing to do with picking you to be on the show. I know. But, <laughs> but totally I, I am going to confess that. Sure. So um, uh, what does this mean to a guy like me that comes in and buys either from a stand or from Reams, which was one of the local growers that has a tendency to buy a lot of locally grown produce. And, and I go in there and I shop for stuff. I, am I in a much better world than I was before? That is the hope. That is the point of this whole piece of regulation is that we are providing safer food and in the event that there is a problem, that it is easier for us to recall that food so the problem doesn't spread. As far as what you would see walking into a grocery store, there probably wouldn't be a whole lot of difference in what you physically see displayed. Um, there won't be labeling changes. So you're gonna see things be very, very similar to what they were before. 
So I, 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 you actually bring up a good point. It sounds like there are two components here. One of them is making food safer, all the stuff that you went through to be a better farmer. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about recalls. How do these regulations affect recalls? So these regulations require that everyone keep very careful and clear records showing where ingredients or foods were purchased from, how they were used, when they were used, and what resulting products they went into. Transporters have to keep those records showing where they picked food up, where they delivered it. So if there's a recall, the FDA should be able to go back through that entire record keeping trail to figure out where the problem started, where that food was distributed afterwards so that it can be recalled very quickly and efficiently. Okay, so we talked about this liability thing. If, if you have some uh, of your mango peach salsa that goes bad, right. the recall is going to cost you money. Do you actually want it recalled? Oh, absolutely. I don't want you to get sick. I mean, we're going to want, we, we, we have, you know, like she said, these farmers down in Colorado, they're out of business. And we want everything safe too. Utah, our, our product only gets sold in Utah. <clears throat> we feel like we're safe. Utah products in general, there's not a lot of processing. When you start doing the processing in the water and adding and cleaning, that's when you start getting into trouble. And generally speaking, a lot of it's just picked from the tree right to the consumer, which is what you try to do to eliminate problems. And then we have our lot numbers. Our lot numbers are the day we pick. So if we do have a problem, we're gonna shut it down. We don't want, you, we don't want, we don't want, it, we don't want anybody to get sick. Excellent. Thank you all. This has been a very good conversation. Unfortunately, far too short. Remember, local government is where your life happens. The efforts of people like these folks right here, and obviously Thane First Fruit, is what makes living in Utah such a good place. Remember, the county seat is reminding you to watch us on social media and to also get involved in your local government. We'll see you next week on the county seat.